we should give Lynn a <laughs> so <laughs> but for all of those who have not had an opportunity to hear Nancy Ole um, present before um, if you have not heard her you are in for a treat tonight um, I actually turned around at a meeting of the wastewater committee and I asked Jim Edmondson if he would help me um, seek a presenter and he literally um, sought out Nancy and I am eternally grateful that he did that for us. So um, Nancy has really gone, um, has presented to many, many organizations. She is from Michigan, Midland, is that correct, Nancy? That's correct. Um, she has presented for the Michigan Municipal League. Um, she is a mentor. She presents to government agencies. She um, uh, does performance management facilitation for over 25 years. She consults. She does executive coaching. Um, she's uh, something that is um, some to be very proud of. She's won the Athena Award. So any of any of the women in the audience know what that is. So that is a, an award to be very, very proud of. So um, she has um, also won um, let's see, a speaker for the Michigan Mayor's Conference, Rotary International, H. Dow Leadership Academy, MEDC, and National League of Cities Annual Meeting. Uh, she's a, clearly is a sought after facilitator, coach, and consultant. I am so grateful, Nancy, that you're with, with us today. Um, Kathy, you know, um, you know Nancy well. And um, I had an opportunity when you brought her here to Muskegon to hear her present. And I was just telling Nancy earlier that when she was done, my whole feeling was I couldn't wait to hear her speak again. So with that said, I am so grateful that she's here with us tonight. And Nancy, I'll let you take it away from there. Wow, Linda, thank you so much. And couldn't you have said you couldn't find anybody else. I'm an absolute slug. The <laughs> expectations are really low. And then anything we do tonight looks really good. <laughs> I could have my husband come in in the background and say, the real Nancy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, this evening, we're going to be talking about some basics for handling difficult situations. And um, we can talk about them in public meetings. We can also talk a little bit about some of the one-on-one -on -one difficult situations that you might deal with um, in terms of some of your constituents. And, and actually, um, I am sometimes called in to deal with difficult situations. And, and sometimes it's not the public that is the difficult situation. Sometimes we just don't play nicely in the sandbox with each other in terms of, of our boards. And so, um, it, you know, no one is immune from bad behavior on any particular occasion. And it really um, behooves each of us to stay a cut above in those situations. So what we're gonna be talking about this evening, I'm gonna give you, um, I, I'm just going to peel a little bit of the onion around the Open Meetings Act with you. And we're going to do that to give you the context because you literally have that, that fiduciary responsibility in your roles um, to, to be open to the public, to hear the public, regardless of, of, of what individuals think and where they, uh, where they land in terms of issues in your township. And then certainly we're going, going to talk about dealing with some disruptive situations. I would ask that you hold questions until the end, but that might mean that you either want to um, you know, pull out your phone and, and take those questions on your notes, or if you've got a pen that you might write those questions down. So just to give you a little bit of context, in terms of being a legislative body, you have the responsibility to listen to all of your constituents. 
And then your responsibility is to represent the majority in your community. Now, the Sunshine Act is out there um, with, and, and the Sunshine Act is, is deemed that because as we operate um, advocating for the public, in fact, we are operating in the sunshine. And so the public is entitled to complete information regarding the affairs of government and the actions of those who represent them. And so if you look just at the yellow, um, because we're, we're just pulling information for our particular purposes this evening, um, you know, under, that, under the Open Meetings Act, we have rules that can require each speaker um, that they identify their name, their address, any other unique interest at the time of public comment. So that is an expectation that you can lay um, in your township. Comment can be on any government issue that the speaker feels may be of concern to the residents of the community. So for some of you, you might be thinking, oh, I really want to set the boundaries of this discussion on the agenda um, items that we're dealing with on any particular uh, day or evening in terms of meetings. But actually, um, speakers can speak on, on any topic, so they are not going to be uh, bound by your agenda. Um, what we want you to keep in mind is that with the Open Meeting Act, very reasonable rules can be put in place to minimize the possibility of disruptions at meetings. And I really encourage you to put reasonable rules and boundaries in place. Um, and let me give you an example here. Um, I was working with a city in the, uh, the, the metro area a couple of years ago. And um, in, in terms of zoning, uh, there was a group that wanted to build a mosque in that community. And you can, um, you can imagine it, it was going to be on a main street. So um, the traffic coming in and out, uh, some people felt were, was going to be a disruption. Of course, there were, there were people who were coming on all sides of the fence on this issue. But in this community, they had never laid a boundary of the number of minutes any speaker could speak. So citizens would get up and speak for 20 minutes. And then the next citizen would get up and speak for 15 minutes. And they were having meeting after meeting after meeting that was going until one, two o'clock in the morning on this issue. And, and of course, when, when I came in to take a look at this, I'm saying, oh, wait a minute, why don't you put a two or three minute max um, for public and for each individual in terms of public comments. That way you can have the majority of the people who are coming to these meetings, you can have them heard, they can be very concise. And, and under the Open Meetings Act, then everybody does get heard with no boundaries on that. That was not happening in that community. So if in your township, if you don't have um, what we would call a, a reasonable time limit, um, then that's something that you're gonna wanna take a look at instituting. Now, if a person is disruptive, they can be excluded from the rest of the, of, of the meeting that they're being disruptive in, but this is not like the National Football League where somebody is, a, you know, is called for targeting and they cannot be in the first quarter of, of the next game. It is not like that. So you cannot exclude somebody from future meetings. And in the best interest of, of just having good relationships with people, uh, we really do recommend that you give people warnings before you'd actually remove somebody um, from a meeting. Now, in terms of requirements for the Open Meetings Act, it requires a time be set aside for public comment at each and every meeting. Now, this doesn't guarantee that everyone will be able to speak on, on any topic because you can also set time limits for your meetings. So for instance, a, a lot of townships, a lot of municipalities for that matter, will set a 30 minute time limit in total for public comments. And the timing of that can take place during any, any time that you designate during your meetings. Now, I want to do a prevention with you right now, because I've, I've had a lot of cities who, um, uh, you know, councils have said, well, we're going to place our 
uh, public comments at the end of the meeting in hopes that people give up on the issues and they go home and we don't have to deal with some of the disruption to the meeting. And in, in my opinion, that's a rather naive approach because it's not like people aren't going to be engaged in side comments in body language, in the stomping of feet, the, you know, all sorts of mannerisms that will let you know their uh, dissatisfaction on a particular issue or not. So I really do encourage that you, um, that you have public comments um, closer to the beginning of your meeting rather than holding them until the end. Now, your presiding officer will maintain order of the meeting and they will be covering your agenda items as well as your consent agenda. Uh, the general public cannot challenge your parliamentary rulings of the board. Most boards do go by Robert's Rules of Order. There is no mandate that you have to follow Robert's Rules, but most do. And the public has no right to address the board when we go from public comments into deliberations. So for those of you who are new in your seats, um, that's an important thing for you to be aware of. That public comments is a set aside, that when, you're, you know, when your board actually gets into deliberation, the public does not have the right to address during, um, during those deliberations. Now, um, let's go down to just a little bit more on decision-making under the um, Open Meetings Act. Um, there is a, a phrase that we term, you know, around the horn decision making. And what around the horn decision making um, would be if you're anticipating a lot of heartburn on an issue, you might be tempted to meet on a one on one with with fellow board members. Um, now, you don't have a quorum, but in fact, those one-on-one -on -one meetings are a violation of the Open Meetings Act. So if you think you're going to be able to garner support for a particular decision with that around the horn methodology, we will tell you right now, nope, that is not going to play. In addition, um, just a, a, a thought in terms of gathering outside of meetings, um, anytime there is a quorum present, Okay. You cannot be discussing um, board issues. You, know, you can go to a ribbon cutting in your community. You can, um, you know, you, you can go to the, the same um, high school football games. You can go to a community event. Um, but when you do so, you do not deliberate toward or make any decisions during that event. And so that is critical because if you are a quorum, okay, under the Open Meetings Act, you've got to be doing that decision making in your meetings, not outside of those meetings. In addition, we've got a lot of people who might be tempted to use electronics in open meetings toward decision making or toward deliberations. And again, that is going to be a violation of the Open Meetings Act. Your deliberation needs to be in the sunshine it needs to be in the face of the public. And, and you cannot vote by electronic communications either. So your roll call, your show of hands, or other visible method of voting has to be um, made uh, visible to the public. Now, some of the things you may, you may not love where people are going to be weighing in but under the Open Meetings Act, we need to allow citizens to express opinions on matters of public concern, regardless of what their opinion is. Now, during those public hearings, okay, during um, their opportunity to speak, you are not taking any official action. Um, you may be called to gather facts related to proposed action. You might be gauging people's opinion during those public hearings. Um, you might actually take it to a town hall meeting to meet um, a large number of the public. And in a lot of cases, you may have citizens who are venting frustrations. Um, I, I had one of the funniest experiences ever. It was going to be a very, very hot um, town hall meeting. Um, they were going to be doing some visioning. This was in a, this was not in a township, it was in a, a county. 
and we literally covered Township Hall in, in those large 3M post-it notes with opinions on, on finance and use of parks and land use and um, it, you name it, we were covering it. And there was a, a citizen who was attending who was wheelchair bound. And um, she had asked me if I would help her put her post-its up on the wall. And by the way, um, I, I took this approach of having people do post-its rather than just having people come to the microphone so that in fact, we could hear a larger number of people, but it also on the prevention side in terms of dealing with disruptive behavior, people's voices could be heard through writing but it did not garner the, um, the emotion that would come with people speaking. So in fact, that might be an approach that you would wanna use on occasion, especially when you do have a, a highly controversial or emotional issue. But anyway, get back, getting back to the story, um, this woman asked me if I could put some of her post-its up high since she couldn't reach them and I asked her at the end, I said, so what did you think of the process? And she said, oh, I think the process was absolutely wonderful. She said, you only made one mistake in it. And I said, what was that? And she said, you didn't ask people to put their names on their post-its. And I looked at her and she said, because I wanna know if any of the nutcases who are representing some of these thoughts are my next door neighbors. <laughs> and I just, I just thought that was absolutely precious. Um, but in fact, um, it was a great way to get a large disparity of opinion on some very emotional topics for that particular county, but doing it in a way that did prevent much of that disruptive behavior. Now, your role in meetings, um, and, and each of you really has to put your poker face on because you need to show respect for others' views. Um, you may find yourself at some point compromising for the good of, of your community. And so in fact, when it comes to how we, um, how we put our game face on, the last thing you wanna do is have anyone in your community feeling disrespected. We want you to exercise good judgment. You will always be going back to the logical on decision-making regardless of whether there's disruptive behavior in your meetings or not. You will consider what um, impact your vocal minority have on the decisions to be made. Um, you'll also look at not only the long-term best interests of your township, but also any unintended consequences, which by the way, sometimes uh, that disruptive behavior does tell us about the unintended consequences. So we should be welcoming that. And you will be making decisions in keeping with your strategic plan and the greater good of your community. Um, by the way, when you are moving into your discussion of issues away from public comment, but your board is now meeting, I want you to keep in mind that personal remarks are always out of order in debate. Um, you keep focused on the motions, on the principles at hand, not the motives of individual board members, nor personalities of individual board members, nor, and, and um, I say this from experience, um, I've worked with boards before who they may not make the personal attack against a, a fellow board member, um, but they hit below the belt on family members. And oftentimes in township government, I mean, you know, our parents were there, our grandparents were there. We know a lot about members in the community and it's real easy to make those below the belt comments. And so I would really ask you to stay a cut above in those situations never make it about the motives or the personalities. And I'm saying in board meetings, but in social media as well, represent your township well. Um, a number of years back, I was called into a township that had a millage that was going to be coming up. 
And um, the board was at odds with each other. They just really, um, they made everything personal. They talked over one another. They were rude to each other. And after meeting with the board, of course, the, um, the newspaper was there at that meeting. And the, the next day, the local newspaper's headline said, consultant tells board to grow up. Now, <laughs> I hadn't told them to grow up, although quite honestly, the, um, the reporter probably did read my mind when it came to that. But the fallout by them making personal comments, being rude and talking over one another is that their citizens did not trust them as a board. And I already knew in advance that that millage was going to go down in flames. And that millage was important to the township, but it was going to go down in flames because of the trust that was lost by how fellow board members were treating one another. So let's make sure we stay a cut above. Um, so your, your presiding officer has primary responsibility for preserving order. Um, as legislators, you have immunity from liability for enforcement of your count, uh, council or township rules, provided you do not have the intent to silence speakers. Now, when I say silence speakers, I'm saying silence what they have to say, the content of what they have to say, not how they're saying it. So in fact, um, if, if you have rules of order that say, um, we will give somebody one warning if they are using F-bombs in, in your meeting and somebody continues to be that disrespectful, you literally can remove that person from your meeting. So those rules are there to enforce the will of the majority while respecting the ability of your minority to participate in dissent if they would like to. So um, we are just about getting into some of the, the, the mechanics now of dealing with some of that disruptive behavior. Now, as I said earlier, Robert's Rules of Order, they are, they are the principal vehicle parliamentary procedure for um, most local government in terms of what they use, but they are not mandated by the state. Um, the nice thing about using Robert's Rules is that that consistency of how you run a meeting breeds confidence in the public because if they go to one meeting, two meetings, three meetings, they see that continuity of order with all, um, with all of those meetings and that builds trust. Now, in terms of public participation, you have the authority to adopt rules related to public comment. Now, remember, they've gotta be reasonable. They've gotta be flexible. They cannot discourage what people have to say but they are there to maintain order, to conserve time, to give people the ability to weigh in on issues. Please, there is no need to respond to questions or demands during public comment. In fact, it is recommended that you do not do so. The greatest gift you can give during those public comments, again, the poker face looking like you are welcoming whatever someone has to say, the respectful nods of the head as you are looking at people, but all you are saying, regardless, it, that person can stand there and say, you are an absolute idiot. You haven't done your homework. Your facts are all dead wrong. Your response to that is, thank you very much. You don't need to telegraph your agreement or disagreement. You are going to stay neutral. Thank you very much is going to be your go-to phrase. Now, if you do have a citizen who is just off the wall in terms of being um, off the mark, in terms of, of valid information, you may want to designate a city official um, or a township, um, one of your employees to follow up with that individual. So, this is some good stuff for you to be thinking about in terms of acceptable policies for public comment. And many of these are built in to actually prevent disruptive behavior from happening. You know, we have preventions in terms of some of those ground rules, and then we have interventions when people aren't following the ground rules. Public body can restrict the time for public comment per speaker. And so it, whatever, 
those number of minutes that you deem is acceptable. Um, I wouldn't be going much over three minutes unless you really have a lot of wiggle room in terms of how long you want to spend in your meetings. Public body can restrict the total time for public comment. And oftentimes people go with that half hour rule, um, that guideline. Um, you can determine when public comment is allowed. So as I said earlier, um, a lot of people think, oh, if I wait until the end, people will get tired and they will leave. No, that's usually not the case. So I would encourage you to have those public comments early in the meeting. You can limit each speaker to one opportunity for public comment um, per meeting. So that is acceptable. Um, if you build into it, you can limit comments to topics germane to the agenda at special meetings, um, not at general meetings. Public body can establish and inform and enforce rules on decorum. Um, now this is unusual. Um, it, we, we can do this in Michigan. Um, it is not done very often. And really when you look societally at, at how loose we've gotten, uh, probably what would not have been acceptable in 1970 in terms of language that people are using at a meeting um, would be used by your fifth grader today. A public body is not required to respond to questions during public comment. And I, not only are you not required to answer questions, I encourage you not to do that during public comment because now you are getting into um, debate in decision making. And all we need to do is hear the public. And then as board members, you will engage in debate and discussion and decision making. And public body is not obligated to list public comment on the agenda, but you do have to provide that opportunity. So with that thought in mind, I'm going to give you 30 seconds just to stretch. You might want to stand if you have not been standing yet. And then we're going to talk about, uh, we've done the preventions now. We're going to talk about some of the interventions to put in place. So go ahead and stretch. Stretch. Um, ask, ask Kim. In the okay, we've had our 30 seconds. So this really becomes the question of the day, doesn't it? Um, I, I, I love this comment. Politeness has become so rare that some people mistake it for flirtation these days. Um, most of us are just really asking why can't people just be civil? And some of the research out there, um, and actually a lot of the research that was done before uh, the pandemic, illustrates that Americans are, um, we are overworked, we are overtired, um, that of workers in the workplace prior to the pandemic, that one in four workers were chronically angry, and I don't know what the numbers are now, but um, your guess is as good as mine, but I think both of us would probably agree that that number has gone up at this point in time. The signs of incivility that we are seeing at your meetings now, and again, this is not just by members of the public, not just your citizens, but sometimes it is between board members. It includes name calling, accusations of people lying or bending the truth. We are seeing more and more profanity. We're seeing belittling comments or put downs. And, and then some of the less obvious incivility is what you actually see in, uh, in the picture here. Uh, you know, the rolling of the eyes, the sarcasm, um, the exchange of looks between board members the disrespectful, angry, rude, demeaning comments to one another. And we don't want to see this from the public. We certainly do not want to engage in it 
between each other, we can respectfully disagree, come down on different sides of the issue as board members. I love this comment by Dale Carnegie. Any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain. And most fools do. <laughs> on the other side of it, being negative only makes a difficult journey more difficult. You may be given a cactus, but you don't have to sit on it. Now you see it highlighted here where I say, let's stay a cut above. And I learned this lesson beautifully from, um, I, I will not name the, ele the elected official's job because then you'd be able to find out who this person was. Uh, but this was a number of years ago. I was, I was working with Stevensville, Michigan. And we were talking about issues of servicing citizens more effectively. And this lady um, came up to me on, on one of the breaks and she said, Nancy, I just want you to know that I am the best person you will ever meet in your life in terms of service to citizens. And I thought, "My, well, she's not too humble, but <laughs> I said, so what's your secret? And she said, well, it certainly isn't because I like people. And I thought, what? She said, you can't have done this job for 20 years and still like people. And I'm just looking at her. And, and she said, I constantly stay a cut above. So she said, if I have a citizen who comes into Township Hall and they are polite and respectful, I am jumping over things to get to them timely, accurate information. And she said, if somebody is rude to me, she said, I will never descend to the level that, the, that they descend. I will always stay a cut above. And I thought, oh my goodness. Um, one, she'd done this job for 20 years and she was probably close to burnout in terms of doing it, but she had found a way to navigate with this cut above mentality of always treating people well. And by the way, when we treat people well, they elevate. And oftentimes we will find people even apologize when we stay cut above. Um, it, my, my husband always says, you know, if you get two pigs in the mud wrestling, both of them are going to get dirty. So let's not do that wrestling match. Now, this, um, this quote from Sister Elizabeth Kenny, um, she says, he who angers you conquers you. And think about that in terms of disruptive behavior. He who angers you conquers you. They've already got you. So instead of letting that person spur your anger, you need to redirect your efforts and think about, okay, what, what makes this person tick? So if that person needs respect, um, you may want to validate that. Now, again, you're not going to do that in a board meeting. You're not going to validate them. But if they're, if, if they're hanging around after that board meeting, um, you, may, you, you may just uh, paraphrase what they had to say to let them know that you were actively listening. If they need some compassion, maybe a little empathy. And if they need a good quiffs, <laughs> kick in the, the pants, please restrain yourself. Keep it in perspective, 50% of everyday problems that we are dealing with in local government are created by difficult people. And by the way, the negative behavior is primarily done to wear you down. So understanding that people are trying to control your emotions should help you um, help you contain those emotions. Um, and actually, there are many groups today that are out there working together um, to disrupt you. I mean, literally, we've got groups that will, um, if you've got a hot issue in your community, they're getting training that um, if there are five people from that group that wanna be heard that night, they will literally position themselves in five different places in the room so that you're not shutting down one small group 
and that they, in fact, if you are televising a meeting, it actually looks like there are more and louder voices in the room because they have positioned themselves all over the room. So when people are trying to control you, you, you need to, to stay on top of that. Um, yeah, they, they may want it all their way. They may be throwing a fit. And again, they're just making fools of themselves if they are absolutely out of control. And by the way, the rest of the public sees that. You don't have to call that individual out. Everyone else sees the behavior that's going on in the room. Now, outside of your meeting, um, you may have people before your, your board meetings or after your board meetings. If people want some control, we always say, give them a little. But what you do is you control the options. I actually, I, I think this is like when we were raising our kids. You know, your, your child wants to go to bed um, late and you say, well, you've got two options. You can go to bed on time, or you can go to bed 10 minutes later if you are reading. It's a win-win situation because you've controlled the options. So when, um, when you have a citizen who is coming to you and they want control, you may ask them, would you prefer this or would you prefer that? But you're only giving them options that are acceptable in the township's eyes. Now you can't control what they have to say, but you certainly can manage yourself. So you're not gonna to react to that difficult person. You are going to be calm. You're not going to take the comments personally, even though, again, particularly in townships, we're small enough communities that it's very easy to make it personal and to take it personally, but we're not going to do that. We will have a plan in advance for, for responding to your emotional triggers. You're gonna breathe, you're gonna empathize, and you're gonna move into problem solving mode. Um, by the way, I'm planning in advance for responding to emotional triggers. You know what your agenda is. You know what the hot topics are. Your phones have been ringing. Your emails are getting full up as people are communicating with you in advance on some of the hot issues in your community. Because of that, you know what to expect to get from people. And so you are already thinking about how am I going to respond? How am I going to manage my face? How am I going to manage my breathing? When we say breathing, okay, this is what you, this is what you get tonight for the big bucks. You know, I say, well, breathe. When dealing with difficult people and difficult situations, this is your best line of defense to breathe. Think about this, how many of you, when dealing with a difficult citizen, a disruptive person in one of your meetings has in fact said something that you regretted or um, that person makes the disruptive comments, your meeting is over and then you think of two, three, four things that you wish you would have said differently. There is literally a physiological reason for that happening. In fact, when you get tense and when you got that disruptive person, or you, you may have a whole room full of them, um, what happens is you tense something. You may be tensing your fingers, you may be wearing your shoulders like earrings, you may have TMJ. But what happens is any muscle in your body that you tense demands oxygen, meaning we have more oxygen going to that tensed muscle than you do your brain. So what happens after that person sits down after that public comment? What do you do? When they sit down, you go, thank goodness they sat down. But in fact, you're breathing again. And so the breathing is a critical, critical element of you having all the resources that you need to deal with that difficult person. So mentally, give people the right to be angry. You know, you can recognize their differences, recognize the aggressive behavior of somebody who needs a little control and maybe, maybe you give them a little. Please do not be suckered in by the anger. 
Focus in on that person. By the way, many of your disruptive people are being very emotional. You cannot talk reason to somebody who is emotional, frustrated, angry until they've vented um, that frustration and those emotions. So you do let people vent and you're listening very carefully to them. And then just like in police officer training, you are going to react below their intensity. You do not match it because if you match it, it is going to escalate the situation. And because we do have mental health issues in our communities, if you feel like you are being threatened, that is the time to call your sergeant in arms, take a recess in the meeting, um, have that sergeant in arms address that individual. Perhaps they need to be removed from your meeting, um, but you do not get yourself backed into a corner in dealing with that. We have all sorts of people that are, are difficult. You've got the person who, no matter what you do, you, you guys can't get anything right. You've got the know-it-alls who are speaking in absolutes. Um, you've got your, city, I, I love the city attorney wannabes who handpick their cases. Many of them are 50 years old and not, not uh, following any past precedent. Um, you've got the people who are primping for the camera, the people who will push the rules and those character assassins that you've dealt with. What you're gonna do is you're gonna main eye contact, maintain eye contact around the room. By the way, this seems like a very simple thing, but when you give eye contact to the disruptor, you are validating them. You are also inviting them to speak more. You are inviting them to harumph more, to gripe and grouse and make side comments to people around them. So do not give them the gift of that eye contact when they're being disruptive. Now, you may have a disruptor who actually has some legitimate points. So don't stop listening to those. Don't second guess yourself if you don't know all the facts. Hopefully other board members do. Keep control of the meetings. So if you're gonna have those guidelines, please enforce them. Um, don't think that holding public comment at the end will help and don't be afraid to disagree with fellow board members either. Um, you're going to keep a cut above, you'll keep professional. Um, but you will be logical. You are not going to get into the proverbial pissing match with people. You are not going to argue. You are going to be calm because of course you're breathing. You will remain in control. You will be centered. You will be, you will be respectful. You will be the professional in the room. Remember that if you have media who are at your meetings, they are not going to capture the negative comment made by the citizen. They will capture your rude comment back to that individual. And you're gonna be the person who looks like you got egg on your face. So you're not gonna go there. Um, you will be attentive. You will look at those, um, those reasonable people or supportive people in the eye. Um, never debate with someone who is entrenched in their views. And that includes in your, your letters to the editor. I mean, sometimes your disruptive public is um, in, in your local paper um, or your social media. Do not get engaged in those contests there. Um, you may state your view of the situation, but you are not going to get into an argument. And as I said before, um, when negative people get very worked up, sometimes they just need somebody to actively listen to them. So maybe you just paraphrase back what that person has said, and that in fact lets them know that they've been heard. Sometimes that person at your meeting is gonna restate and restate and restate the same thing over and over again because they don't know that they have been heard. <clears throat> and then certainly, come across as that person who can help where you can. Now, one word that I don't want you using with the public when they are being disruptive is the word, but. You know, you acknowledge what someone has to say and then, but, and you come in with the rest of the story. The word, but feels like talk to the hand to that individual. They may feel drop kicked out to that parking lot 
and that's not what you want to do. So in fact, um, you may have tried to be empathetic, but if you use the word but, it's not going to come across as empathizing. Um, the last couple comments I'm going to make before we leave it open to questions is um, there are th these acronyms of, of bad with the B is for you know your your aggressive behavior versus mad, which is misinterpreting some of that behavior and actually exaggerating it um, in your own mind. And so you may have citizens or fellow board members with bad behavior, but let's not exaggerate it to the point where we overcompensate and we make it worse than it is. So if you've got your angry antisocial people, what they are looking for is feeling validated and um, be very careful that when you're actively listening, you don't come across as agreeing. Um, as Americans, oftentimes when we listen, we nod our head. Don't be nodding your head as you're listening to that angry person because it will come across as actually agreeing with them. Um, but you can actually ask them to bring it down a notch. So set the ground rules again, asking them to speak to you in a calmer tone of voice. If you've got that know-it-all and, and we've got them in every community, that person wants respect. So our job is not to put that person in their place, even though we sometimes would love to do that. Please don't ever treat them as inferior. You're just going to get more of the same then. And so what you might do is say, here is where I agree. Here is where we see things differently. The drama king or queens want their story heard. And that's where our, our two, three minute time limits in our meetings really gives us a lot of bang for the buck. Um, we will pay attention to them, um, may empathize very briefly, but then we need to refocus them on the facts at hand. And if you've got the chronic complainer, and, and those people will come to every meeting, right? Because, um, you know, there's something wrong with what, you, what your board is always doing. Um, you do not want to validate that, that point of view. Um, you may focus on your rules of process, your rules of procedure, the policies that you have, uh, but please do not get sucked into um, that negativity. And if you've got that very aggressive person, please do not be intimidated by that. That's exactly what that person is doing. So you're getting back into that breathing at that point in time. Um, you may, um, if they're coming at you after a meeting, you will stand up to them. You'll, I literally say you do the, the plant from your feet to your shoulders. So a very solid plant when talking to them. You let them vent um, It may, may call them by name um, so that they feel like they're getting attention, but you do not go into flight mode with that individual. And then your sneaky attackers often are your sarcastic people, um, the ones who are who are looking to, um, to to get that additional group of people at that meeting. And um, with that sneaky attacker, they don't have a lot of confidence, but they certainly can get a lot of done. Um, and oftentimes they will they will bring others um, to speak in for them. So. Just to have a little levity as we open it up for questions, you know, we say you may be tempted to take this approach. Dear haters, I have so much more for you to be mad at. Just be patient. Or um, Benjamin Franklin, who says, remember not only to say the right thing in the right place, but far more difficult still to leave unsaid the wrong thing at the tempting moment. So for any of you who have opened your mouth and inserted your foot, you may really want to take a pause. Wise men speak because they have something to say. Fools, because they have to say something. And haven't you felt this way on occasion? Some people should use a glue stick instead of a chapstick. <laughs> now, by the way, 
I did not include um, a link, but um, St. Saint, uh, Saint Joseph County literally has a civility in public office statement. It's on their website and they use it not only in local government, but they also use it for their chamber of commerce and for some of their nonprofit boards around St. Joseph. And I love this statement. I'm just, I'll leave it up here for a moment for you to read through it. I don't have to read at you. Is this not good? Um, I had the, the pleasure, I was doing um, board development for redevelopment ready communities for MEDC and somebody from St. Joe was there and they, they brought it. Um, so so this, is, this is where you actually see it on their folder. And then um, they also include, why was the statement created? to increase the effectiveness of the meeting process at open meetings and organizational meetings, to conduct dialogue in a respectful way, to hear people's opinions, make the community more open and allow for more diversity, and to see a decrease in disrespectful dialogue and personal attacks. And, um, and, and you can see on the right-hand side um, a variety of the places that they are using it. I encourage you to go to their website um, and take a look at it and see if you couldn't incorporate um, some of the, the, um, the values that they really um, embrace in this because I find it so healthy. And when it comes to disruptive behavior, oftentimes that disruptor, disruptive behavior is in fact just unhealthy behavior. So does anyone have any tricks of the trade that you have found to be very effective, um, would you be willing to share those? Or if any of you have any questions, very, very happy to take those as well. Trudy. Trudy, can you, would you maybe, yeah, maybe stand up here closer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> I taught for 34 years and I mostly had at risk students who were very troubled and it helps just simply to lower your voice in a deeper tone. Just it calms you. It calms them and it diffuses real quickly. Especially when oh. is angry and emotional. Judy, that is a wonderful suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. Oh, Trudy, sorry. Trudy, that was, tr that was Trudy. <laughs> okay. Trudy, is you're new, is that correct, Trudy? New. She's new. Yeah. <laughs> and already making a contribution, thank you. <laughs> got on the committee to find a new treasurer and they found me and I got that. <laughs> Great. And, and Kim Arter had something that she wanted to tell us as well, um, which was kind of, which was important, uh, something that she noticed when she was holding her board meetings. Can she come closer? Can I come closer, Ken? Oh. Sorry. Okay. Lakeland Township didn't give us a good enough microphone. <laughs> Kim, Kim is the supervisor for Lakeland Township. Oh, thanks. I'm down here. So if you notice our American flag and our state of Michigan flag is over here, it always used to be under this screen here is our logo. It always used to be up here. It always bothered me because I'm turning around my backs to the audience. I don't know what's going on out there. And with the crazy things that go on today, it was an uncomfortable feeling for me to turn my back to the audience. I don't think it was a good idea. So that was our strategy. Move it over there. Everybody faces that way. And then no one's stabbing me in the back. 
So, oh my goodness. Sure. Liter literally or figuratively. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, I don't know whether you thought of that yourself or you got that from a police officer or a sheriff. Um, but that is a great suggestion on how to do that beautifully and not have your back to the public. I have a question. Um, when you have a time limit set, is it ever a good idea to a time limit for public comment, either individually or the entire public comment section? Is it ever a good idea to extend that if somebody needs to, or should you always stick to that one comment or that one time? Oh my goodness. Um, I, I struggle with making exceptions to that on the fly. Um, now, if you, if you were um, expecting an issue and um, communicating that in advance, unless of course you've got your ground rules built into your charter. If your ground rules are built into the charter, you actually don't have the wiggle room to be able to do that. Um, but I would never do it on the fly because it would it would probably look arbitrary. Okay. I need to take better note of that. <laughs> yeah. That was Jennifer, and Jennifer is the um, supervisor of Muskegon Charter Township. Okay. Okay. Uh, Nancy, I have two questions. Um, one was, uh, I, I think we've handled it, but we just started writing it into a policy that is not quite yet um, been uh, approved, but almost everybody knows in Muskegon County, we had this horrific uh, meeting that over a noise ordinance, but it's where we first um, um, had people, and I'd never experienced before, where people were yielding time to each other. So it was the first time that that had ever happened. And so we decided to write that into a policy that you could not do it. We actually called MTA, and it's not something that is anywhere on the books. Mm -hmm. So, but we decided to place it in a policy so people would know that we don't have to do that. Um, what's your thought on that? Um, well, I would agree. Um, if, if you were to yield time to others, um, what you are likely doing is yielding to a professional and oftentimes not even a member of the community um, who, is, who has been brought in to speak on that issue. And so um, keeping true to having individuals speak for X number of minutes would be the preferred methodology to go. So I'm glad you're rewriting that policy. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I have one other, one other question where we're often finding that in meetings that it, community members are not aware of Civics 101. <laughs> so um, you, it's almost as though, even though we, we're trying to, um, it's like you have to teach during the meeting. Mm hmm. So um, while so, while we're trying to while we're trying to host the meeting in the proper manner, mm -hmm. the, the members of the audience are just arbitrarily standing up and essentially doing what they want, and then you have to say would you mind sitting down uh, and this is not the appropriate time? Right, right. They don't want to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> oh, um, so what's your question around that, Linda? Well, it's like, 
how the heck do you get them to sit down when they don't want to? <laughs> when they're not willing to, that's exact. I, I mean, when they're not willing to and short of getting the, in Cedar Creek, we're essentially 20 minutes away from the police mm -hmm. coming out. If, should the police be able to come out right then? Um, well, um, first off, if you've got a hot issue coming up, like this, no this noise ordinance that you were talking about, um, I would have the police already in attendance at that meeting. Um, just the uniform itself is, uh, it will give more order um, to the meeting. So, so you've got that going. Um, you certainly should, um, should be considering having a sergeant in arms um, that can escort somebody out of a meeting if they refuse to sit down. Um, you may want to be doing a couple things. Um, one is you may want to explain very briefly at the beginning of the meeting what that order is for public comment and what the guidelines are. Um, and you can also have those posted um, in your township boardroom so that people can look at that as well. Um, another thing that you might wanna do is have a link to those guidelines so that you literally could say in your board meeting, um, you know, if, if you, if you wanna take out your smartphone and go to that link, um, if you're not familiar with the protocol that we follow in our meetings, um, then they've got access to that information um, that way. And you may also wanna think about, um, you know, what can you do in terms of um, teaching people through some of your nonprofits, your, you know, your Rotary or your Kiwanis Club, um, and even, you know, can, can you do something in the, as you said, civics class, um, in your civics classes, in your high school so that students are going home and they're actually teaching parents and starting to get conversations going about that. But literally, if, if you post your guidelines for public comments in your meeting, it's very easy to refer people back to those comments. And I'll tell you, it, it is well worth it to spend one minute doing that up front so that when you then, Linda, have to correct that person, it's not the first time they've heard it. If it's the first time they heard it, they think that they are being shut down because of the value of what they're saying. They're not thinking about the process. So if you explain the process up front and then you call them out on it, um, they're a little bit more likely, um, unless they're so emotionally distraught that they're not going to listen to anything. And then, then you need that sergeant in arms or your police officer to escort them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for Nancy? I have one more quick one. This is Jennifer again. <laughs> we, can, yeah. we can time limit public comment, but can we time limit board comment? Or put no. a limit on how many questions they can ask? <laughs> Unfortunately, Jennifer, no. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, but remember from, from the PowerPoint I showed, um, you cannot be texting each other your comments. You know, if you feel like things are going too wrong, you know, too long and you're thinking, oh, I want to make a comment about so, so and so. No, do not be texting each other during that meeting. If you believe somebody was texting each other about the discussion, can you FOIA that? Um, oh, you could FOIA it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, anything digital is, is FOIAable. Good to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And did I really see that, that one comment in there that you can... Um, control the length of the comments? Was was I right in seeing that? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you wanted to say that we've got 30 minutes in public comments, you could do that. Um, now, that would be different than a special meeting. So if you're calling a special meeting, you might have, um, you might have open comments, you know, for, for two hours. 
but so, in your general board meetings, you you can say how many minutes you want to limit that to that section too. So in my meeting from hell in May, <laughs> I could have literally said we'll limit this to 30 minutes. Does it have to be a board rule already established or can you limit it at that meeting? No, uh, and, and that's a good point. You cannot limit it at that meeting. It has to be in place. So that's got to be a policy. Yeah, so so Linda, you probably want to address that in policy pretty soon. Okay. Thank you. You bet. I am. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions? We can move can, on. Can I just make a quick comment? Absolutely. Sure, Kathy. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know, I, I see that at the beginning, this is being recorded, which is good, because otherwise we are going to ask Nancy to record it separately for us. But we do plan to put um, the presentation part of this meeting on our GMED website. So you can let your other board members know that. If, they weren't able to be part of this meeting that at some point, and we can let Linda know, um, okay. at some point we will have that up on our website as well. And, and already the sessions Nancy did back in the spring, those are already on our, web, <coughs> excuse me, our website right now. And, and I'll make sure that the rest of the people who weren't in attendance get a copy of this also. So yeah, great. excellent, yeah, excellent. Yeah. And then, Linda, if you want me to send you a copy of my slides, I, I can certainly do that as well. Perfect. That would be great. Okay. Now, everybody remember, breathe. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it, it is basic physiology. Um, you remember, if you're stressing those muscles, that's where the oxygen goes. You don't have as much oxygen going to your brain. So if you're able to relax those muscles and breathe better oxygen flow, you'll think clearer. Nancy, thank you so very much. Uh, we really appreciate this. We, this has been very helpful. I know we all had questions that um, were important to each of us. Um, we've all had a meeting that was um, my May meeting. You know, at least I knew if I got shot, it was on camera. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh. So, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I can imagine you needed to breathe so you didn't pass out, right? Linda? I, I did. I did, but I did manage to say thank you for your comment throughout the entire meeting. So excellent, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. You bet. Kathy, take care. <laughs> thank Kathy, you, Kathy, thank you so much. Please You're thank welcome. Jim for us. Okay.